You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Beat Happening formed in Olympia, Washington in 1983 by Calvin Johnson, Heather Lewis, and Brett Lunsford. The three of them had met while attending the Evergreen State College in Olympia, and by this point Calvin had already started his label, K. They released the Our Secret single in 1984, with two cassette EPs following later that year. Their self-titled debut album was released in 1985. In 1987, Beat Happening recorded a joint EP with Screaming Trees before turning their attention to their second album, Jamboree was eventually released in 1988. In this episode, for the 35th anniversary, Calvin Johnson, Heather Lewis, Brett Lunsford, and producers Steve Fisk and Gary Lee Connor reflect on how the album came together. This is The Making of Jamboree. I'm Heather, and I am a member of Beat Happening. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, which is a sort of side note, but like, I've never considered myself a musician. And so when people now talk to me like, well, you're a musician, and oh, do you miss playing the drums? And I'm like, no, I'm not a musician in any way. But at no time was I like, I want to work to be a better drummer. And you know, like, and I listen to our songs now, and um, I mean, I appreciate our music, but I don't listen to our music, and I've never listened to our music, and I don't listen to bands that sound like us. You know what I mean? Like, musically, it's not what I was doing. I think what, when well, now, in retrospect, it's like, it was like this little revolution we were banging on a door, you know what I mean? Like every show was banging on a door. It was very hard until, pretty much until the very end. <laughs> then people were like opening the door. But in the beginning, it was always banging on the door. And I think that when we got, to, you know, doing Jamboree, it was like, okay, people are hearing the knocking, <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, so maybe we should keep banging. I see you hanging that crowd, staring me down like that ice cream cone still on my My name is Brett Lunsford, and I'm excited to talk about this Beat Happening album, Jamboree. Yeah. I'm Calvin Johnson, uh, and like Heather and Brett, I am a member of Beat Happening. One of the things when I think about that period of um, between 84 and 87 was there was a lot of space in time between the first album and the, and the second album. And the second album through to the rest of the albums were like a different chapter in the band. And the first record and the, those years around that first record were a prelude to that active phase that began with Jamboree. At first, we didn't know what we were, right? We were like starting a band and we put out a record. And then it was like, oh, okay, well, now we're out there. Like, because before we put out the first record, no one really knew who we were. And yes, we had been very active, the three of us, in 1987 in live shows. But it was uh, interesting. And, and I guess 
somewhat prompted by Rough Trade US having a uh, interest in releasing the next record. There's a way in which I feel like Jamboree was a reinvention of the band from the recording sessions, the very recording sessions for the first record. Well, the album was recorded in uh, the summer of 87. We would we had been doing shows that year. We started the year in January doing a bunch, of, a series of shows with Girl Trouble and the Screaming Trees around the Northwest. Steve Fisk was living in Ellensburg and uh, he was working at the studio and he said, why don't you guys come record here? I'd gone there a couple of times to record other things, just uh, mixed tapes, and uh, he also was duplicating on my tapes for K. So I, I'd already had a relationship with the studio and had visited it, but uh, then it was like, oh, we should record there. In the other recordings we'd done, it had the feeling of, well, let's try to stretch this afternoon and get as much as we can accomplished in this one afternoon, and that was... That was a recording session. So to have a multi-day opportunity where we were like, oh, well, we've got all of this time. It seemed like, well, it was, uh, you know, 10 times as much, five times as much time to devote to it. And, and we weren't in a hurry to get on to something else. We were kind of, I guess, keeping our creative minds open for this extended period of time and living where we were working for that piece of time. So that was a, I think it provided some real opportunities to explore things at a different pace and a different depth than the prior sessions. It was also the first time that I'd never seen, like we could see free videos because the Connors worked at the video stores. Going over there meant that we could like go into the video store and pick out whatever movie we wanted for free and then all hang around and watch it, which was what we would do after we finished. I feel like we watched a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. You know, like to be able to like watch a movie without like going to a movie theater and paying money, that was a big deal. Another thing that was different between this resorting session, which was in August in Ellensburg, and uh, other sessions for the first album, which were not in August, was that the studio was nice. It was a nice place to be it was a nice environment it was clean it was but it was not freezing cold i think that's the important factor at the greg sig sessions were both in places that had didn't really have heat and they were done in the fall or winter where it was cold and so uh not being cold while recorded that was i think an important factor i don't know if you guys remember that or or you agree or whatever but that seemed pretty important that seemed very significant to me, that difference. I think it was part of the whole package. Like going into that place was like, oh my God, wow. This is like this recording studio and it has a place to sleep and we get to go stay and look at free videos. And, you know, like everything was like magical about it and comfortable. When we worked with Greg, we did all the vocals afterwards and uh, that was a problem because for instance, the song Our Secret was really all about half as long as it was supposed to be. Because it's basically the same music all the way through. It doesn't change. It's the same three notes over and over again all the way through. And so um, they were like, okay, let us know when it's long enough. And I hadn't really done that before. And uh, I was like, oh, that seems long enough. But it wasn't. It was like half as long as it was supposed to be. So I felt like we should do the vocals at the same time, it would be better. And that was possible because when we worked with uh, Greg, we were in very primitive situations where there, was m there wasn't more than one room. At the Velvetone studio, there were various rooms. We had things set up in different rooms. And uh, I was able to sing most of the songs from a, s a separate booth. I can't remember exactly, but I think a lot of the um, takes from the original recordings were end up used on the album. I got excited that we were like, because it was like rock and roll and, you know, so, and I think that was when that was like emerging, like, oh, wow, we can, and then what I mean, it was kind of like, we were like kind of a band then. I saw you flying your plane, driving me insane, hit me with a bone till I'm all alone. Driving that car, saw his arms, 
all that black as tar must be your heart. I got a crush on you. I got a crush on you. What am I to do? I got a crush on you. I got a crush on you. Got a crush on you. Making me so blue. I got a crush on you. My name is Steve Fisk, and I recorded the Jamboree record. Calvin and I were both volunteers at KAOS Radio in Olympia, Washington, which was a community access radio station that was on the campus of the Evergreen State College. Having a 15-year-old DJ at the station was a big deal for us because we went out of our way to service the entire uh, Olympia community. So Calvin was kind of legendary at the station, and I was warned that he was a weirdo, but he was a nice guy. And I just had to get past it. Uh, after I graduated, I went to San Francisco and joined Pell Mell. And when Pell Mell broke up, I moved to Ellensburg. And I started recording The Screaming Trees. And at this point, the K record company was up and running. And they actually were instrumental in helping us distribute the first cassette that The, that the Screaming Trees put out, Other Worlds. And oddly enough, Calvin knew The Screaming Trees because he had lived in Ellensburg when he was younger. So when I mentioned Calvin Johnson, there was this little glimmer of recognition from Lanigan and Van. And I mean, that little guy that used to crash his bicycle into the bike racks in front of the record store. And I went, what? And says, oh, they had chicken fights, apparently, when Calvin was like 10 or 11, where people would charge at each other on the Stingray bikes or something like that. But uh, they couldn't believe that he was grown up and had a band. Guy says, oh, yeah, no, he's got a band, he's got a voice, he's got a sound. And then obviously they went on to make that wonderful uh, record together and they played shows together and played together in Ellensburg and other cities. This is Gary Lee Connor, and I used to be on the Screaming Trees. And I co-produced the Jamboree album. 1985, when we um, had done our Other Worlds cassette, Steve's like, oh, I know this guy, you know, Calvin has K-cassettes in Olympia and he can help you guys, you know, uh, didn't put it on K, but he helped us like, you know, distribute it. So that was the first I heard him. And I was like, boy, I remember that name. That's weird. I remember the guy in junior high named Calvin Johnson. It was this little guy who, the only thing I remember was that he had pulled a fire alarm, like a fake fire drill. And everyone had to leave the building one time. It was like seventh grade or something like that. He lived in Ellensburg, like in seventh and eighth grade, and then he moved off to Olympia. So, but then in uh, the summer of 1986, we uh, did, our first show in Olympia, and he helped set it up. So he was there, and I was like, whoa, it is. It's the same guy. <laughs> and so, you know, so we kind of hit it off right away because of that. And then, uh, I mean, we had, you know, really two years, 86, 87, and probably 88, too. We had a lot, you know, in common with uh, Beat Happening. We played a lot of shows with him. We did shows, several shows around with Girls Trouble, Beat Happening, and, and us, and kind of more like Bellingham, Anacortes, but, you know, outside of Seattle. And that was like, you know, because the whole thing was, was like with Beat Happening and even bands like Nirvana and the Melvins and all those bands, they were all outside of Seattle. But outside of Seattle, there was a whole nother music scene, you know, and uh, that was like part of, you know, Beat Happening was a big part of that. And, and uh, we became part of that too, being like outsiders. And then eventually we got together and did that Screaming Trees Beat Happening EP. And they came over to Ellensburg one night. We Stayed there all night long. That was a lot of fun. We stayed up till 6.30 in the morning and finished it. We recorded the Screwing Trees record in, in July of that year, but it was not at, it was not at Velvet Tone. It was at a, the Screwing Trees practice space. Well, Steve wasn't a part of the recording of the Beat Happening Screaming Trees EP, as I recall. That was just kind of like a get-together in the back room of a video store where, they, where Screaming Trees had their their practice space set up and hangout space. And we did the recording there, just the bands working on it. Who who would you say was engineer? Because I certainly know I w had nothing to do with the recording. Well, it was Lee, Lee Connor. Was in, he had a, a cassette recording machine. I think it was a cassette four track. Yeah, that we used. And I think we, did we do it in one night, day? Yeah. Well, now that you say that the the Screaming Trees thing was before, it seems like one thing was that we were like a band and 
we knew them from playing shows. You know, like we were starting to have relationships with other bands. And yeah, that, that all happened by themselves. I couldn't believe it happened. Frankly, it speaks to how worldly the Screaming Trees were at the time, where they could see a record could happen between the set of people. And yeah, even cranky old Mark Lanigan, you know, that just disappeared. You know, he did beautiful work with Pete Happening and, and vice versa. You know, our earlier music was probably had a lot more in common than... Then later, I mean, it seems later, you know, like in the 90s stuff with all the drug addled hard rock and Seattle grunge, all that stuff, it does seem kind of weird. But, you know, we were totally, you know, kindred spirits. Like, just it was the whole do-it-yourself attitude thing, you know. And we would have never got into being a real band if we hadn't have realized that you could do it yourself. I read an article right before we went down to record Other Worlds by Giza X. It was in Spin Magazine about, like, don't wait around for a major label if you're a band. Just do it yourself. And I, we took that to heart, and, you know, they were the same way. So we were similar, definitely, in that respect. And I don't know how the Screaming Trees ended up co-producing Jamboree, but uh, considering all of the fights and shit we went through making Screaming Trees records, it was very easy to work with Mark and Lee on this. Those two guys work great together as Beat Happening producers. I'm trying to think about what ideas they had, if any. I think they were there more to approve things. As someone who's produced many records, having somebody that the artist trusts and says, no, that's a good take. I think they just, you know, thought we're coming to Ellensburg to do it, so it'd be cool to have you guys be around and just kind of advise and stuff. And uh, yeah, we I don't remember what we did too much except standing around playing a few things you know that was like um kind of being around kind of changed the vibe of the whole thing because you know we were all friends and stuff and just having a good time yeah i mean what i do remember is just having other voices in the room you know opinions and input they created a, a space of reverence for the whole project and the value of what we were doing they were willing to be there investing time in it like Gosh, these, they must care because they're hanging out here. Maybe they don't have anything else better to do, but they were there. They were there. <laughs> and they were, they were, uh, they cared. And, and that always meant something to me. And I don't remember any particular suggestions. Oh, but he also, Lee also did a lot with the guitars, just adjusting the amps and things for different songs. I remember that he would come out and just sort of do his magic a little bit. Yeah, and always in a really considerate way. Like, yeah. he would never be the condescending sound guy, guitar tech. Really just a helpful suggestion and um, in a very friendly way and not meaning to, like, always willing for us to say, oh, we don't want to do it that way. You know, just really humble suggestions and, and quite often really good ones. Well, because he'd seen, he'd seen us play the songs a lot, so... He had ideas what he thought would be best for that song. I do remember maybe that there was some back and forth arguing between um, Steve and Lee and Mark, but I always just interpret that as like just um, for the fun of it more than substantive problems. At that point, Lee and Mark and Steve, it was more like sibling rivalry or something. They were just bickering about stupid stuff all the time. But yeah, that first day when we were doing all the basic tracks on this like bewitched and uh crashing through and stuff and just looking up in the booth and seeing steve and mark and and lee and steve and i just remember after bewitched and um both mark and lee were just laughing and just it was like yeah you did it it was it was kind of exciting they were like that was it you did it I was listening to the record yesterday and it made me wonder, 
what guitar we were using. Calvin, did we still have the silver tone? Did we record this with the silver tone? Yeah. Yeah, that was there. But but I think um, I have a vague memory that we didn't do a lot of recording with our own guitar. I think we, in both both sessions, we used other guitars. But we might have. I feel like we used, maybe Lee brought a guitar that we used mostly. This is so funny, and it's illustrative of how much we are... Uh, music tech people. Calvin certainly has technical ability, but I'm often baffled by the way that people develop, uh, say, a guitar sound consciously. We had one pedal, one effect that was a distortion pedal, and I don't even remember what brand it was. I remember the color of this basic pedal, which seemingly just had an on and off button, and it was kind of a butterscotch color. Calvin, do you remember what that what that was? Yeah, that was my brother's MXR distortion pedal <laughs> that Streeter <laughs> lent us and for several years, and then finally he wanted it back, so I had to give it back to him. And then I tried to find one. I think I eventually did find one, but you, you ended up using that, uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, we toured with uh, a band called Heavenly at one point, and... Um, Pete Momshaloff from Heavenly had, uh, when he got to the United States, he bought this little compressor pedal and for his tour. And at the end of the tour, he was like, do you guys want this? And Brett had been using it on tour, and he really liked it because it, it made a distortion sound. So we used that as our distortion pedal after that. But that was after Jamboree. I didn't even know we had a distortion pedal. Well, we didn't. Streeter had one. <laughs> The yellow thing sounds familiar, though, but I guess I'd never really thought about it. I don't think I ever used it. You know, nowadays it makes me laugh. Like, people are, like, asking about all this, like, what did you use on this and that? It was like, you know, what we used was what was there or what's cheap or what, you know, like, it wasn't like, I'm looking for all these, like, pedals and amps that cost, like, $50,000 and I'll choose this one. It wasn't that at all. It's like, you know, whatever you could get at a pawn shop or at a music store for cheap and you know so um as far as that goes you know we were definitely similar but i feel like that song was more like um heather had a guitar part on a song called i love you that was really rock and roll and i was really like uh, appreciated how simple it was yet it sounded very powerful and uh so that song her her playing on that song inspired me a lot to try to make a song like that but i never i never was able to because it it's so unique and perfect i loved that song i love you yeah worked out really well i really love calvin's rock and roll songs <laughs> and i always really liked that song i don't know why we chose to put it first my brother had uh had that guitar pedal that i borrowed and so i think i was just playing around with that and then uh brett had been working at this place called gesco in Olympia was like a, a venue and a performance space and a meeting space. They had lots of different events there, but uh, Brett had one of the people, he and Denise and a, another friend of theirs started that space. And I remember just standing at that space watching artists, people perform music and that song, uh, just the words sort of started to develop just from standing around Gesco and watching other artists play music. I think I remember just thinking that would be a good song. Got a crush on you, making me so blue. I got a crush on you. What am I to do? Got a crush on you. I understood that they were making a heavier record than what they'd done before. By not having a bass player, you could turn the kick drum up as loud as you wanted to. And that became part of the beat happening sound immediately. So there was a gigantic kick drum in this not very aggressive music. Uh, they were pretend casual because it really wasn't casual. Everybody really, really cared about what they were doing and kind of 
brought their A game. They weren't, you know, lackadaisical college students or anything like that. People don't know about the Supreme Cool Beings. And that was a very good band in Olympia, Washington that predates the Cool Rays. And Heather played drums in that band. And she played normal rock drums. And everybody gets all, you know, whatever about the beat happening, drum sound and all the repetition. And, oh, my kid could play that. You know, all this, you know, things where they don't really understand that playing something simple for three minutes or five minutes is hard to do. And being steady and simple is very hard to do. Just wanted to say, while I've got the ear of the beat happening world, Heather was a great drummer before she was ever in beat happening. She wasn't learning how to play drums and beat happening. She knew what she was doing. And she would tell you she wasn't and that she didn't know what she was doing. But she really, uh, the Supreme Cool Beings rocked. And there's a cassette. It might still be in print on K of the Supreme Cool Beings. And it's a live set. And you can hear Heather with a full drum kit just banging. You know, she sounds really good. Full confession, I did not listen to the Yellow record that much. The first record. I mean, I had it. It was in the studio. I thought it was really cool, but for me, that was in context of the Cool Rays. It was just an, another Calvin record. It wasn't the beginnings of Beat Happening. There was more Heather all over it. That's what I keep remembering, was that the, the Heather presence, the, her vocal was, was, I don't know if there were more songs, but it, that was one of the things I liked about the record, was hearing kind of her voice be a bigger piece of this. I love Calvin's songs, and I think Calvin's a fabulous songwriter. Thank you. But I've never, so any song that I've ever, like, like pulled up out of me was very difficult. And that's why there's not many of them. <laughs> I would say that I was never excited. I would say that I was always the one that was the reluctant, had to be convinced to keep going person. Songwriting, I had to like, I felt like I was obligated to produce something um, to justify my existence at that time. Like that was the only way I knew how to to justify my existence in the world. It was like something that maybe like the first time that I felt seen. So it was like, okay. And it seemed like I'm going to go with this. And I remember when my parents met. It was years before my birth. And I can see them years from now. There goes fly above the earth. And let's not talk about what makes us die. Let the jokes make the years go. It's interesting because I was, now my parents are both gone <laughs> and I still think about when they met, you know what I mean? Like somehow you have this sense of your ancestry, you know, you carry your ancestral <laughs> story, you know, it really just, to me, it sounds a lot like where my head was <laughs> at that time. I mean, it was pr profoundly lost, you know, and between childhood and adulthood really lost <laughs> in this place that, you know, that's what it's about. There's a mask upon the wall In between the window and the hall In between all things ever done What's ahead and where you come from If you could Beat Happenings, like, their whole sound was, like, 
like an innocent thing with a little bit of there was every once in a while there was a little bit of weird like adult stuff in it. You know, it wasn't really kids, but I, they always reminded me of like you know peanuts or something. Like if if like the peanuts guys had like when they were teenagers, the band they would have would have been Beat Happening. You know that. I could always see that, or or the the part in the Christmas special where they're all dancing. That always just reminds me of Beat Happening so much, you know, because that was the vibe. It was like you know this really cool innocent music thing, and it was nothing. You know, nobody was really at that point. No one was really on drugs. You know, people probably smoke pot once in a while or something, but it was no there was no heavy drugs or anything like that. It was just pretty innocent. We were all pretty young. Breakfast in cemetery, boy tasting wild cherry, touch girl apple blossom, just a boy playing possum, we'll come back for Indian summer, we'll come back for Indian summer, we'll come back for Indian summer, we'll come back for Indian summer. There was a version of Indian Summer that it was written on the bus that was probably three years earlier. And then I was walking home and I lo- I forgot the whole song by the time I got home, except the title. But then uh, a couple years later, in fact, I know exactly what day it was because there's a poster here. Um, let me look here. We played a show with the Screaming Trees and Gold Trouble at, at the Capitol Lake Park in Olympia. And that was on August 8th. 1987. So that was after uh, we had recorded the the Be Heaven Screaming Trees record, like two weeks after. But a couple days before that, on Tuesday or Wednesday of that week, is when that song, I just woke up and I just, it suddenly just, oh, that, oh, okay, Indian Summer, okay. And it just came out. And then I was like, okay, well, that song seemed pretty good. So I had a rule that if I write a good song, I don't have to do anything else that day. So I went swimming. And then on Friday, when we got together to practice for the show the next day, the show in the park, I said, oh, here's this new song. I don't really know the, the music for it, but here, just play these two notes over and over again, and uh, that'll be fine for the show tomorrow. And then we can figure out this music later. But then two weeks later, we recorded the song for the album, and it was just, that was it. I remember it being new, feeling very new in the studio, that um, we had been playing a number of shows earlier in the year, so I feel like some of the songs we'd had a chance to work out live, which is always, you know, things can, are a little more developed then, and this one was just, completely fresh, which is also a nice approach sometimes to have in the studio where we where you're um, getting the feeling of the song's invention while it's being recorded and that excitement comes through. What is that cheerful sound? Rain falling on the ground. We'll wear a jolly crown. Buckle up, we're wayward bound. We'll come back for Indian summer. We'll come back for Indian summer. We'll come back for Indian summer and go a separate way. Was it an electric 12 string that the trees had over at the studio? Maybe. I don't remember. I don't I didn't have my electric 12 string or whatever. No. It's all part of the mystery. I had a uh, an old uh, Moserite 12 string that I used on a lot of tree stuff, but um, that thing, there's no way it could have sounded like that because it was like one of those, like, you could hardly play it. It was so hard to play. Like, you got to fight the guitar to play it type of thing. I had possession of Bill Owen's guitars. Bill Owen was the guitar player in Pell-Mell, and the old Pell-Mell sound was based on Moserites. And a Moserite guitar, uh, that's the sound of the Ventures and other notable places. It's not like a Fender or a Gibson. It's kind of a weird off-brand. And Pell-Mell barely used the 12-string because it was so hard to 
to tune. It was always falling out of tune. The guitar was kind of in crappy shape. So when Beat Happening picked it up and wanted to use it, I was like, first off, like, wow, this will be cool. And then second off, Indian Summer doesn't really change. It only plays in one chord all the way through. So it wasn't hard to make the guitar work if it was only going to play one chord. And yeah, the minute that sound happened, it sounded gigantic. It sounded huge. It was like, wow, this does not sound like the rest of the record. You know, is that the most melodic song on the record? It might be. That's probably one of my favorite songs ever. So, and like, it doesn't say on the record that I play. I played the acoustic guitar part, and so every time I hear, it, I'm like, I can't believe I played on that because it's like one of the coolest songs ever. You know, it was so easy too. Da da da. da. And it was like over and over again. It is really hypnotic. What I like about it is that it's the same three notes as Our Secret. And basically, they're both songs where the, the music never changes. And uh, it just goes on and on. And I like that. I like that. That same as Bewitched is the same. Just the same three notes over and over again. No change. I mean, I always love the song um, because I'm not a guitar player it was always a little bit hard for, for me to like make sure I didn't miss those two notes, you know, and um, get through the song. But uh, yeah, I always loved the song. I never quite saw it like why so, you know, like why that's the song that like so many people would like associate with Beat Happening. I remember just the simple drumming, the hypnotic guitar and the way that Calvin's lyrics told such an evocative story that um, really had a timelessness from the start. And I think that's what appeals to people. I touch your hem, you say, let's stroll down Martin Way, pick Plum's abandoned farm, who let norms come to harm. We'll come back for Indian summer. We'll come back for Indian summer. We'll come back for Indian summer. Then go our separate ways. Cover me with rain. Walk me down the lane. I'll drink from your drain. We will never change. I think it's a, just a great song. And the part about Martin Way, which is street. In Olympia, we first that's the first street you come to is like the exit. It's like Martin Way <laughs> when you're coming from Seattle or Ellensburg. And um, it really captures the idea of what everything was like in the music scene back then. That was like what it was, you know, if you want to like get an idea of what the whole beat happening at Olympia scene was like, that's it in a, you know, just this innocent, beautiful time when people are just having fun and not caring about viruses or wars or anything like that, right? You know, I mean, that's a lot of, when you're young, that's a lot of the way people experience being young. But that was, you know, for us, it was like include music, which was, you know, really cool. And that song really kind of just like brings back that memory for me, I think. Motorbike to cemetery, picnic on wild berries, French toast with molasses, Croquet and baked Alaskas We'll come back for Indian summer We'll come back for Indian summer We'll come back for Indian summer Cover me with rain They always had that, you know, it's like this innocent thing, but wait, you're not innocent. It's like the loss, suddenly it's not quite as innocent as you thought. He's always got this evil side, too, in all the lyrics, you know? There's this, it's just like, it's like the kids singing, and then suddenly something about Satan or, you know, like, sexual references or something like that that come up all of a sudden. <laughs> There's a little village near the center of Spain Where a jealous brother pulled a cold-blooded cane Dirty job, it had to be done When they asked for takers, there was only one Cause I'm the hangman Yeah, hangman I'm the hangman 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 
It wasn't too often that we went over and over and over different versions of the songs. I think that, personally speaking, I just love the freshness of a great take and the enthusiasm we had for it. And and maybe historically, looking back at it, you say, well, maybe we could have re-recorded this and tried this or that. And I think we had more of a sense of that option in later sessions. But to get to something that caught the spirit of it in the Jamboree sessions, we would feel like, okay, we got a good take and let's go on to the next one. I mean, I think that it wasn't like, oh, wait, let's try that again. Or I think I can do it better. (laughs) Well, that's certainly true about this particular song. Um, We've only played this song live maybe two or three times and it never really worked. And I think the problem was that um, I wasn't able to sing it what they say on key and somehow the song we did it one time and it worked and that was it and it happened to be recorded and that was amazing and it was like we're not going to do it again because there's no way we're going to be able to do this again so we did it and i think we tried to play it on tour after that but it just didn't work like maybe once or twice but i couldn't quite get into the the place where the song was and uh, it sort of fell apart live. So fortunately, um, Steve was able to capture that. I wake at four, wash my hands, pray to my God, atone for my sins. Walk out to the yard, test the rope. When the dawn breaks, I start to work as I'm a hangman. The issue with the string getting caught on a pickup screw happened on Hangman and and being inordinately proud of my ability to, while playing the song, get the string off the screw was the the, uh, lasting memory, but for no good reason. But you can still hear that in the song. Again, you you can hear a lot of use of the distortion pedal. It's another Calvin song in terms of both the lyrics and the guitar part. That song in particular, uh, when I lived in Ellensburg as a child, I used to be really into comic books, and there was a Marvel Comics, there was a couple series, like Where Monsters Dwell, Journey to Fear, a couple other ones, I can't remember. But they were um, comic books that were reprints of 50s comic books. So um, they had all these stories from the 50s, And one of them was this story about a hangman who had been in a long line of hangmen. His father and his grandfather had been hangmen. And then he was just like, you know what, I don't want to be the hangman anymore. And he decided he he wanted to quit and do something else with his life. And he just didn't want his kid to become the hangman. And so he quit. But somehow, I can't remember the story exactly, but the king was really upset that he quit. And somehow, so he ended up getting arrested and all this and... I can't remember if he'd done something bad or I don't remember. But in the end, he ended up having to get uh, executed for his crimes. And his execution was the first execution of the new hangman who happened to be his son. And that story, it was like, oh, that's a great story. So um, that's what I base that song on. I feel no shame I return to my family at the end of the day Sit and watch my son while he's out at play When he grows to be a man He'll be just like me He'll be a hangman I'm a hangman Yeah, a hangman I'm a hangman Hangman See, there's some irony there. He wanted to make it so that his son wouldn't be the hangman. So he, he quit. But then in doing so, he ended up causing his 
son to be not only be the hangman, but to kill him. It's deep. I tried to walk away to prove I was in control. There's got to be a cure. This can't go on no more. Dressed in black in the midday sun. Break the ice and on the run. Keep this up, there won't be none. I tried to be real cool. You locked me in a room. You tried to take off your dress. We both know what happened next. And when my skirt begins to ache, I realize that it's too late to love you like a chocolate cake. Jamboree, that was their idea. They went out on the uh, the balcony because there was a second floor balcony of the studio. And then I was like, hey, Steve, we want to do this one on the balcony. He preferred that we were not in the same area as him because uh, we had uh, some pretty extreme body odor that he objected to. <laughs> I don't remember that at all, <laughs> Calvin. No one wanted to say anything, but Brad, but... It should be said that Calvin and Steve were old friends, so this might be an inside joke of theirs that he's wanting to rekindle. You know, it was Calvin. There weren't a lot of surprises with Calvin at this point. I think that's the record where he ate green peppers and had a lamb hat on the whole time. It was like a character he adopted. I'm pretty sure this was the record, but it was a gray hat and it had like flaps to protect your ears, but the whole thing was colored like a sheep. And he would periodically go, bah, which Calvin can really do a good sheep with that, that crazy voice of his. And he ate green peppers, which was the only thing that stank. It was the control room stank of Calvin eating these raw green peppers. Brett and Heather and I, we went outside onto the, the balcony. There was a I guess it was a, maybe it was a fire escape uh, from the studio. And the thing is that it's in Ellensburg. It's in a place that's like the industrial part of Ellensburg. Ellensburg is a town of maybe twelve or 15,000 people. But it does have an industrial district. There's the Shockey's uh, uh, slaughter yard, you know, cattle yard. There's several uh, agricultural processing plants there, uh, Lanigan talks about working at the carrot processing plant and the blood the running uh, down the streets. Yeah, just blood running down the streets. So we were out there in the evening. It was, you know, probably 10 o'clock at night, but it was still these carrot processing plants run 24 hours. So they were going. So that's what you hear in the background is this industrial hum of the agricultural processing. The studio was down by the train station at the end of Third Street. It was, you know, a pretty deserted area. There was like a Twin City Foods. There might have been some background noise of like Twin City Foods too, because it's like they uh, process, you know, vegetables and stuff like that. They bring it from the fields. And there's always, always some kind of like whining noise in the background, especially at night. It's kind of creepy, you know, and there's not very many people around. Cause we both know you're my dream date Wear an old potato sack Trailer for a hat Haircut for a bowl Two eyes made of coal One, two, three, one, two, four The bees are hop, the bees are ho But that's one thing she'll never know He's a great performer, you know? I mean, he can get out there and just his voice has this real power to it, even though it's kind of like not quite in tune, kind of like, you know, we're, but it's just like, he's got this power to back up whatever he's doing, even the, even if it's slightly dissonant at times, you know? And um, it's just, you know, his thing, and it's really cool. A lot of people couldn't pull off doing acapella. One of the approaches of the band, I believe, is wanting what's best for the song and also being open to simple approaches that it, Less is more. Sometimes it, a song doesn't need embellishment to be its best form. And so I think that um, being conscious of not adding things just to add them was, in my mind, about our creative process. And uh, I love the, the bravery that is a part of the a cappella songs that was very impressive to me at a point, especially that I wasn't singing in any form and and afraid of the thought of singing that the ability that Calvin and Heather had to the courage to have just their voices be what 
an audience was hearing was a powerful moment whenever it happened. Don't know how I feel today. I feel the same as yesterday. Five hands calling up my back. Thump, thump, have a heart attack. And oh, hey, well, okay. Aren't you gonna ask me what I did today? I'm going up and down. Hit the ground. Black and white. What can it be right and oh, hey, well, okay. Well, I remember it's very difficult to perform <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, singing a cappella live is, was really difficult. Um, so I don't think we did it very much. I don't think I sang this song very often. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say, but I, I mean, I wrote it and we recorded it. And then it kind of went out of my head because we didn't play it much. Where did Rich record it? Corvallis, wasn't it? At the Old World... Yep. Um, Old World Deli, which is a college town oh, restaurant. Right, right. Yep. Corvallis, Oregon. Yep. Did we ever play it again? <laughs> yeah, we've played it many times. <laughs> All right. I would say that a lot of the touring that we did had a feeling of a family vacation. When people think about a rock and roll tour, they might jump to illusions about music venues and that weren't a part of the early experience of a lot of what we did, which seemed like it was offbeat venues and galleries and and house parties, really Im improvised settings a lot of times. And, and our trips were, we were looking to have fun along the way and, you know, meeting the people that were going to be hosting the show and the other bands and lots of fun on the road experiences that the band management or label aspect of it were really <laughs> almost non-existent in these years. Yeah, it was kind of like, let's go spend a weekend somewhere and hang out with these people and, and watch Arnold Schwarzenegger movies if we can. <laughs> Our shows just really varied. You know, like when we would get to the East Coast, we would be supported had more or audience support than we did here in the Northwest. We had a lot of like the really sort of challenging and difficult shows would be the ones where people just didn't know what to think of us at all. And, you know, including like the other bands, because you're on tour and like a lot of times you're just playing with some band. It's like, we didn't have a drum kit, you know, and, and then I'm like the girl that doesn't have the drum kit asking if I can borrow the drum kit. And there were nice things about being kind of the only girl around. And then it was also really hard to be the only girl around. I can hear Heather influence in female performers all through the 90s. There are people that took a lot of inspiration from Heather. She took so much shit because uh, she was a woman and because you know, she sang pitchy and all of that. Um, Calvin caught his share of shit, but Heather had a lot of guts. I think that singing a cappella was confrontational, pretty much, you know, at shows. So it's wrought with, you know, sort of a certain amount of like aggression, but also a certain amount of fear because you're being reacted to by your um, behavior but you're in the middle of it and you got to keep going and see it through when you're just singing up there bare, essentially, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of emotion going on in the room. Aren't you going to ask me what I did today? Got a pumpkin and a tree and ideas all flowery. You got a joke, a smoke and punctuation, but not enough time for conversation. And oh, hey, well, okay. Aren't you going to ask me what I did today? Yeah, Crashing Through. This is one of the songs Brett was talking about where we had a chance to play this song quite a few times before we recorded it because all year we had been playing these shows around the Northwest. But we had actually recorded it earlier. We had done a session like a year earlier with Patrick Malley and we recorded it. So we would already had recorded it so we had a pretty good feel for how the song would, would look and feel and stuff. 
but also having played the song a lot um this is one of the songs that like lee and and mark were like had knew well from our sh live shows that was one of the songs they were expecting that we were going to record this and bewitched were songs that they seemed interested in working on back burner is on fire freeze dry clean then retire yeah yeah that top coat's overdue yeah yeah gotta get a new haircut too yeah yeah who says dreams don't come true whoa whoa got a new thing crashing through sent wood top over tower hope you drop don't go sour yeah yeah back seat step over jewel yeah yeah heard about that on the news yeah yeah can't stop that lopsy do I kind of have a recollection of finding a sheet of metal and uh, kicking it outside on that stairwell for added crash, but I don't know if I'm remembering accurately. That's a sampler. Everybody thinks Pete Havening are troglodytes, you know, but I had an ancient uh, one sample at a time sampler and a Kai S612 for those of you keeping track. And I had a sample of somebody slamming the dumpster downstairs. And so I remember Brett trying to make something happen with some sheet metal. And I don't even know if we ended up keeping any of that, but that brought to the idea of using the sampler. So on their second record, they were using a sampler. <laughs> so there, there's our cave people be happening, you know, and who played it? Heather played it, you know? Well, and not only that, but the way the old samplers work is you'd sample it once and that sound would be spread off over the whole keyboard. So, you got the sound of a dumpster lid being crashed you play it 12 steps down and it's slower and weirder and more lo-fi you play it 24 steps down which is easy to do on a keyboard and it's godzilla so i forget what kind of chord she was playing but it wasn't just one key down crashing through it was something that she'd work out on the keyboard intuitively on the spot go evergreen you know <laughs> that's that's how we do it you know I was trying to remember which song had the had the uh, sampler on it. Of course, it's crashing through. Push cart, that won't go. Catch a ball, then overthrow. Yeah, yeah, that's old school. Yeah, yeah, that's overdue. Yeah, yeah, skip that too. Whoa, whoa, got a new thing crashing through. Whoa, whoa, got a new thing crashing through. Whoa, whoa, got a new. Thing Got a new thing crashing through. Hello, can you guys hear me? That was strange. I was somewhere where you guys, none of you moved. It was like you were just frozen in time. And I was blathering on and on about crashing through. And you guys, it was almost as if you could care less. <laughs> <laughs> What was the song you said was recorded Catwalk. by Pat Malley? Catwalk. Oh, Catwalk. Oh, okay. It says it on Jamboree. I don't remember. Yeah, it's after Crashing Through, and it has a diamond next to it that says produced by Patrick Malley. Oh, okay. So that must have been from that session from uh, we did Crashing Through and Look Around and Catwalk and some other songs. Yeah, in 86, we recorded it at Yo-Yo. I don't think we played that song live too much, Catwalk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some. I like the percussion. Heather's playing the uh, claves. It's cool. Oh, yeah. I like claves. Yeah, I had those claves for a long time. Uh, I just lost them a few years ago. I stole those from uh, from Jan Brock. <laughs> or maybe she gave them to me. I can't remember. <laughs> or maybe I borrowed them and they just never got back to her. I don't remember. But she had a band called Twin Diet where they played the claves. And uh, I always thought they were really, it was really cool that they had the claves. So I think I might still have one clave, but it's like a, you know, it's, it's difficult because it's almost the one clave is like the sound of one hand clapping. 
<laughs> I know that I very much was, I imagine, very happy to be playing the claves because I like the claves. Yeah. Well, I think maybe it's the only other song that might have had claves would have been Jamboree. I don't know if there are claves. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think that Heather had a had made a comment once that I always thought was very appropriate in terms of an observation about recording, and because uh, there's a uh, there's an instrument called a, a percussionism called the vibra slap, and she said that every album should have one song with a vibra slap, but no album should have more than one song with a vibra slap, and uh, I think that's probably true of the claves too. And I think there's a vibra slap on Jamboree, but I don't remember where. But maybe I'm wrong. I do. I do like, okay, I like vibra slaps and claves. Yeah. But I don't think we put claves on more than one song per record. I also really like those frog instruments, but I, we never had one of those. I look at them out together. I don't mind. He's an okay fella. Anyway, it's probably better she stuck with me I'm so bad at being treat I'm glad I'm not stuck with her she's got a bad habit of being pure This is, uh, we're hearing Calvin rum, rummaging around, kind of like um, Oscar the Grouch's garbage can when he, he uh, dives <laughs> inside and comes back. There you go. What? what happened? You're back. What were you digging for? I was just trying to find the clave. I thought I had one left, but I couldn't find it. Hey. Just a little shy There's something in your eyes You could have any guy If you only stick around a while Yet you drive that boy around Drive that boy around Drive that boy around I can't even remember what that song sounds like. <laughs> How's it go? It was just a song that was like a song. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a good song. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is pretty good. But I don't, I don't know. It's like we may not have played it live a lot. I think some, maybe more than the other song. But generally, it wasn't really a. It wasn't really like our favorite song. I didn't really understand this concept of being on key for a long time, and I think I realized later that with something like Hangman, if we just practiced that song. We could have done it, but we never did. You know, if, what if we just spent the whole one afternoon? Let's just do Hangman. Let's just get it. Let's just get it done. We could have done that, but it never occurred to us to do that or even to want to. Later, uh, Brett was able to arrange for us to borrow a practice space from a different band, and we were able to use their space, and they had a PA and stuff, so that was good. But at the point of Jamboree, we were practicing in like apartments and stuff pretty much it wasn't that right i can't remember yeah i think that was right and then that's why the the value of the live experience added so much to um the development of a song because we didn't do the um the rehearsal room development of a song beyond just kind of like oh yeah that sounds good now we're ready to play live these records sound harmless in 2022 in 1987, 1988, 1990, because there was no bass player, because the vocals were out of tune, because the guitars were out of tune, certain people, not everybody, not 50% of the people, but certain people just could not even be in the room with it. And, and by the way, it's always guys. I never ran into a woman that had a problem with Beat Happening. But there's some guys that just because Beat Happening broke all the rules, they can't stand it. I mean, it's not that they dislike it. They can't stand it. On stage, man, he was confrontational for sure. Um, in fact, you know, he would like probably get, I don't think he got mad at people in the audience, but you know, he was like, I'm what I am and fuck you. <laughs> because 
I remember when we one time we had a show with them. I think it might have been when we played too at the studio at Velvetone. It was just, you know there weren't that many people there, twenty or thirty people. This one guy who was a little older probably wasn't that much older he was probably like 30 35 and you know but probably like a 70s rock kind of guy and he saw cal when he saw calvin perform he was just i can't believe how stupid that is but i was going off about it and stuff and it's like okay we thought it was really cool but you know and then imagine you booked beat happening you've heard the record and uh beat happening is in the middle of a national tour in a toyota with a few guitars and a snare drum in the back seat and they want to borrow amplifiers that's how beat happening showed up at gigs so just one further assault on the rock tradition on how things are supposed to happen but and so they made their whole thing work but between like 89 and 93 i recorded the best singers ever you know mark lanigan carla bauslich from the geraldine fibbers kurt cobain chris cornell and by the way, when, when I talk about this, when I try to make this point, I always include Calvin, because I do think Calvin's one of the best singers I've ever recorded. And kids these days, they're going, Calvin Johnson, give me a break. He sings out of tune. Like, you feeble little dinosaurs, you're crawling out of your pond and you're judging things on whether they're in tune or not. That's because your music is devoid of meaning. That's because the music you listen to is gutless and strange and, and leaves you unsatisfied and so you run around trying to figure out what makes things good or bad and when you learn what intonation is you think you've accomplished something you know not understanding that kurt cobain bends flat on purpose carla boslich can make you cry by hitting notes that are quote out of tune because when she blats a note it's for a reason and then it's usually got some kind of resonance with rock history and the, the vocals that have come before and all of that so I know that sounds posy and all of this, but man, pitch is overrated. You know, it really is. And Calvin Johnson is the argument. Don't you mind that daily grind? Cause I walk down the side streets too. Nine to five where I live their lives. Never knowing what the night holds for you. Hey girl, come with me. We're on our own. Can't you see? The world is different. Midnight a go-go would totally could have been a cool race song. That was just him working shtick, you know, uh, working genre. Yeah, that was a song we played a lot, and uh, and that's the one where where Lee plays guitar on that recording, Lee Connor, and he played live with us a couple times when we were doing shows with them, and that was always really exciting because uh, having Brett and Lee both playing guitar together, it's just really powerful, really fun. Yeah, and I think, was there a bongo track on the Nighty Go-Go, too? Well, what does it say on the record? I can't, do you have a copy of the record? Yeah, it's, uh, we recorded it in, in Ellensburg. Yeah, totally. But I think that we, maybe we did try the bongo track in the background at Patrick's and then and then liked it enough to bring it, but it was, it's mixed pretty far back. Yeah. Uh but it's, I think it's there. What does it say? Does it say anything about anyone playing on that song besides Lee? It says Lee Connor plays guitar on Midnight A Go-Go. Yeah. And that's all it says. I would assume that maybe Heather played the bongos. Yeah, probably Heather seems likely. I mean, it sounds like it would have been nice to play bongos on those songs. <laughs> so maybe I did. <laughs> hey girl, come with me. I think I played just those two songs of uh, Indian Summer and uh, Midnight at Go Go. And I was listening to that and I can't remember if it's just the solo in the middle or I'm not sure because they might have been using my guitar setup like uh, for some stuff too, you know. What other stuff? I, I mean, This Many Boyfriends Club, of course. I remember seeing it, watching that. That's recorded live in Ellensburg 
I couldn't remember when I was listening to it. I goes, oh, wait, is that me playing? It wasn't me playing. It was Brett playing through my amp. And that horrible, <laughs> it's like between every song, the Screaming Trees, like early shows, you can hear like, that horrible whining <laughs> feedback, but that became the whole song. This many boyfriends walk her home. This many boyfriends ring the phone. Lori, Lori, what's the story? All those boys think you are boring. They just see those bobby socks. Now what's beneath those curly locks? I have a recollection of being in Calvin's apartment at the Martin, hearing the the song and considering what guitar part might go along with the lyrics. And it seemed to me that the rawness of the song would benefit from just some feedback <laughs> as the guitar part. And so acapella, in a sense, with piercing feedback. Was there ever a different guitar part as no. you were writing it, Calvin? No. No, but there was a different version, the version from Corvallis from that same show that asked me. That version is really good. And it was like one of these two for the record, but the Corvallis one ended up being on the, the Crashing Through single we put out last year. But uh, the Ellensburg version was on the album mostly because it was recorded in Ellensburg. I mean, they're both really good versions. They're both different. They have different uh, emphasis, I think. But uh, we played at the Hal Holmes Center with uh, Screaming Trees and Girl Trouble earlier that year. And Steve recorded the show from the sound booth. And uh, that's what we ended up using. That song was part of a full set that was recorded in Ellensburg at the Hal Holmes Center. And it was a a rec room tied to the library in Ellensburg, Washington, where anybody, I mean, anybody could put on a show. So if a 15 year old kid wanted to put on a show with the screaming trees and Pete happening, he'd go to the clipboard and fill in the date and what they want to do. And the city would provide, uh, you know, some kind of security guard and you'd have a show. And then it was up to the, to the kid to hire a PA system and a guy to run it or something like that. But, uh, that's why we had so many amazing shows in Ellensburg, Washington, because there was no impediment. So we took some of our early digital equipment down to the Hal Home Center and set it up and uh, ended up with a Beat Happening set and a Screaming Trees set. And the Screaming Trees just sounded terrible, just because it was the wrong way to record. You know, a big, loud, psychedelic band was, you know, a couple of microphones in a Grange hall, basically. But Beat Happening, because they had less shit going on, their, their stuff sounded really good. And Calvin, yeah, he's just being as obstinate and kind of in your face as he can. He's popping all his peas. The S sounds are all sputtering. So he's just, just making the microphone just hurt. <laughs> you know? It makes me mad when I see them make you sad. Sometimes I want to be real bad. And shove those words back down their throat. Lori, Lori, what's the story? Let's go do some apple coring. We will bake an apple pie. Maybe that will dry your eyes. If we were playing with other bands who were more recognizable as rock and roll bands, then the ways that Beat Happening would go into kind of unusual territory off script for what the audience had expected, there might be audience reaction. And Calvin was, and Heather both were really good at, at I think, feeding off of that. So it could be that somebody was just spontaneously picking up on something from this strange song they were hearing on stage and becoming a part of it. It was a well-attended show, a lot of teenagers. I think because Screaming Trees had a good local following at that point. So a lot of local teens were there to see them. It was our big show in Ellensburg, and people were like, because we put out Clairvoyance, 
And I guess it was in the fall of 86. And people in town are like, who the heck are these people? Those would be even before we were on SST. But Ellensburg was kind of like, you know, a band with an album in Ellensburg. And, you know, we had like reviews in the college paper that were kind of like this. I don't know if this is very good. You know, kind of negative reviews. And a lot of people are like, those guys suck. But we had a lot of people came and see us. So, you know, probably slightly younger people in the crowd were probably like, you know, high school. Because it was an all ages place. The screaming and yelling audience in the front row is Lori Birdsong. So the idea that, first off, I don't think Beat Happening got that kind of screaming, yelling response in other cities. So I think it was, uh, Calvin was uh, being a proper showman, was, all right, the front row is going to go nuts. I'm going to play to the front row. Did he know who Lori Birdsong was at the time? I'm not sure. Lori would go on to marry Van Connor, and they would have, kids and me and Lori are still in touch but uh but there are three or four screaming girls making it sound like a bad Beatles recording or something like that and it's primarily because he's singing to Lori we tip over apple carts with the pounding of our hearts Lori Lori don't you worry We'll have our own swimming party. We'll swim up and we'll swim back. Now you're sitting in my lap. And there's one thing I forgot. I love Lori a lot. I imagine when it was live, he dropped the mic and walked off stage. I'm not sure, but that was a common finale. I think we were at a good place at that time as a band. We were spending more time together, a lot of time together at that point. And we were having a lot of fun together, I think, at that point. Yeah, when did we go to to Europe? Shortly after this was released, I seem to think. It's like four months after the U.S. release. It was a great opportunity to meet people in Europe who were interested in, in coming to the shows, but also the bands that we met, uh, you know, from Vaseline's to McTell's to Pastel's to The Bats and, and lots of others. Yeah, we toured with The Bats in Germany and uh, in Europe. That was fun. Did it come out before we went to Europe? It came out on Rough Trade in America before we went to Europe. It didn't come out in Europe until the day of our last show mm. in Scotland because of, you know, just production delays, blah, blah, blah. It was supposed to have come out months earlier, but, you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Well, I'm just thinking because, you know, that tour in Europe, you know, like it was, touring in Europe was completely different from touring in America. And it was all planned out and we were like treated really well, <laughs> you know, and People came to the shows, you know, and liked us, and, you know. So there was, like, a lot of positive reinforcement at that time, at least in Europe, I would say. <laughs> like, to go there and just have these, you know, lots of people come to our shows. It was nice. And Calvin did so much work on behalf of the band in <laughs> conjunction with, you know, the K Records effort. In touring and recording, I had the luxury of being along for the ride for a lot of that, the detail work of the coordination with other labels and with the tours. That was so much of Calvin's work that uh, benefited the band. Well, I I hold it in my hand and I think that um, Heather's artwork is, uh, it's a good visual package and the the combination of Heather's artwork and the photo by uh, Ann Colbertson. Ann Colbertson, it captured a part of who we were visually. That I think it, so that package has always felt good. And in my reflection on it, as I stated earlier, I think that the band's future could easily have just passed into history with the first album and. In 1987, there started to be more momentum for future 
projects and that Jamboree was a reinvention of the band as, uh, you know, it was kind of the start of the, the next series of albums in my mind. Well, I think that that's Brett's, descri- you know, his feeling about it is accurate. And, um, but I, and yeah, I mean, I think it's true that it, it's kind of like after Jamboree, there was a different band, you know, it was just a little bit more, it's more like we really were a band. Maybe we really were musicians. Yeah, I feel like when we started playing in Olympia with like Young Pioneers, we're a band that we worked with a lot and, you know, we recorded our first sessions in their studio and used their instruments and, uh, but just they were very encouraging to us and uh, they were very helpful in a lot of ways. And, uh, but by that point that we made Jamboree, they had, they had stopped playing as a band together and I felt like I, I wasn't really even in touch with them anymore, but I still felt that their influence on me was pretty profound in terms of the, their, uh, their rock and roll. They were very rock and roll, they were very punk, and, uh, but also they were just so friendly and supportive. That was a really important part. Yeah, Jamboree seems very optimistic. Yeah, I mean, I think that optimistic is a good description of it. We believed in what we were doing, and it shows. And and other people were too. We had that a sense of being a part of of a music community that we would go on tours with other bands who were friends and and enjoy their music while we played ours and and go out to dinner or go out to the record stores, whatever we were, were doing, we were, it was fun. And I, I think that's a good description, optimistic. Just the music and the, the cover art and stuff just feels very optimistic to me. Maybe there's a point to living after all. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Beat Happening. You'll also find a full transcript of this episode and a link to purchase Jamboree. Thanks for listening.